Welcome back. This is the first video for chapter 15. Chapter 15 is the second video in our second chapter, excuse me, in our three chapter section on expectations. And so in chapter 14, we talked about the financial markets. In chapter 15, we're going to talk about our sort of two major um, pieces of macroeconomics, consumption and investment. So this video will focus on uh, consumption and then the next video will focus on investment. Um, really, the next two videos will focus on investment. Um, so expectations are really important, right? So if we think about uh, consumption as we will in this video, it matters not only you know how much you are earning right now, but also how much you expect to earn, right? So uh, if you expect to earn more, you might take out a loan uh, to consume more now. If you expect to earn less in the future, you might start saving now so that you have more to consume in the future. So investment is going to be really important, and we're going to use our sort of ISLM model in order to think about how expectations might impact our sort of short run and medium run equilibrium. So in the 1950s, Milton Friedman and Franco Modigliani, who didn't really like each other, um, had basically the same theory, right? One was called the permanent theory of consumption. One was called the life cycle theory of consumption. They're basically the same thing. The idea is that um, consumption is going to depend not so much on current income, but on lifetime income. Um, and so, you know, if you... You know, expect if you're in your 20s, but expect to be earning more in your 30s and 40s, then you might go ahead and buy a house now. Um, and you'll have the same house that you have in your you know, 20s as you have in your 40s. Um, so that consumption will be the same, um, but you've been borrowing in order to consume. Um, and so if we think about these sort of very foresighted consumers, then their consumption is going to depend on how much financial wealth they have. Right. So checking and savings accounts. Um, bonds and stocks if they have them, their housing wealth, right, the value of the house they owned uh, minus the mortgage due, their human wealth, right, this is the most important thing for most people, right, because their human wealth is uh, how much income you're going to earn. So you'll expect to earn more income, you know, for the most part as a college graduate than a high school graduate. Um, and But that's obviously going to, to depend on your your human capital. Uh, and then, of course, your non-human wealth, right? The sort of financial wealth and housing wealth. Um, so that's those first two. So the, the, the third one is going to be most important for most people, although, you know, most people in the United States also will have some housing wealth as well. Now, we say this is for a very foresighted consumer, right? Consumers are a mix, right? Not only are they, like, some consumers very foresighted and some less so, but even most people are, are a combination of the two, right? Where, okay, yeah, I can make plans 10, 20, 30 years in the future, but I also have this, you know, present bias where I'm going to want to consume now, um, and that's going to impact my consumption decisions as well. So one way to sort of look at this data is with panel data sets, right? And panel data sets are one of the most important uh, tools that we have in economics. Um, so one example, it basically it, it is a survey that tracks people over time. Um, and so the panel study of income dynamics is one of the first sort of major uh, panel studies. It tracks approximately 4,800 people, started in 1968 and has continued uh, through today. There's also the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth. There's two waves. One started in 1979. The other started in 1997. Um, and we can... You know, use these to ask people about their income, their wages, their consumption, their health, how many hours they work, all sorts of great questions that we can track over time and sort of give us an idea of how people respond to changes in income, changes in wealth, etc. So if we think about lifetime consumption, and remember, this is sort of on one extreme of how people might consume, then their consumption decision isn't going to depend on current income, like we said in chapter you know, three, four, five, six. It's going to depend on total wealth. Now, total wealth is going to include the present discounted value of all of your future income. Um, but so the idea here is if, you, if we could, like if we had perfect foresight and we could know exactly how much uh, total income, total wealth we were going to have in our lifetime, theoretically what we could do is we could smooth our consumption. So say starting, you know, when we graduate from college, 
we could say, okay, I'm 22 now. Uh, I'm going to die when I'm 82. And I have this much income to spend over those 60 years. I'm just going to smooth it out. And if my current income is less than that amount, I'm just going to borrow. And if we had perfect, in, you know, perfect foresight, the banks would say, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. You can borrow against that. Um, but, of course, we do not have perfect foresight, right? And so we might, want, we might not want to plan for constant consumption. We might want to have higher consumption in years when we have our you know, young children or when our children are going to college um, or whatever. Um, we might uh, not just not make these decisions that way. We might not be fully rational. Uh, and there's risk, right? There's always risk in life. There's risk that we become unemployed. There's risk that we become sick. There's all sorts of risk uh, in, in that number. Um, and so the fact is, even if we you know, knew that we'd be making more money, we're very, very confident that we'd be making more money in the future, we might not be able to get a loan. We go to a bank and we say, oh, can you just lend me $40,000 so that I can consume more now? The bank's probably going to say no. So one question is, all right, well, let's think about retirement. Um, so this is just one example that said, okay, retirees um, have wealth that averages around $1.1 million. That's enough for a comfortable retirement. Um, but of course, that's an average, right? Some people are going to have a lot more. Some people are going to have a lot less. Um, Social Security, obviously, is an important factor in that decision because uh, we pay Social Security taxes when we're young. Those actually taxes go to support people who are currently retired rather than our own retirement. But we expect then that we will be able to receive Social Security benefits when we are older. Um, so that's a big piece of retirement income. Employer-provided pensions are a significant piece. Personal retirement assets, um, other financial assets, so that would be stocks and bonds. Uh, home equity is significant for many people, um, and then other equity. But this is an average, right? And so, sure, on average, most people might have enough to retire on, but there are lots and lots of people who do not. Um, and even the median, as opposed to the average, uh, has would have significantly less wealth here um, than, you know, than is listed in the table. Okay, so lifetime wealth and current consumption, we could say, okay, well, that's going to depend on total wealth and after-tax labor income. Um, and the, our expectations are going to affect how much we consume, right? So it's going to affect directly through human wealth, indirectly through non-human wealth. Um, but the fact is, like, if we get a $10,000 raise, um, if it was expected, that might not change consumption at all. We might have already increased our consumption before. If it was unexpected, it will probably increase consumption, but maybe not by as much as we would expect in, the, in our model of, you know, the sort of marginal propensity to consume and all that. Um, so... That's an important fact. I think in from a macroeconomic perspective, um, using current, you know, disposable income is probably makes the most sense to model total consumption. But that's different. Modeling total consumption off of total disposable income is different than modeling individual consumption off of individual uh, disposable income. So one of the things that has definitely changed over the last 20 years is this sort of expected change in family income, right? So for a long time, we sort of expected family income to grow at a 2 to 3% increase every year. After the financial crisis, our expectations were much lower, right? And so if we expect our income to grow much more slowly, then we're going to increase our consumption by less. Um, as you can see, it has recovered somewhat. Uh, I haven't seen uh, the latest data for this, um, but, you know, certainly something like the pandemic can actually, you know, increase people's pessimism, whether or not that it should, right? You know, um, basically because there's so much risk involved, we don't really know what's going on. 